1938, the archaeologist Matthew Sterling set off with his wife for Mexico and after a long journey reached a small village named Tlaco Talpan. There he hired a guide, rode a horse for eight hours, and forded a river just to reach a remote hacienda in Veracruz, Mexico. This grueling trip was all for one purpose, to see a mysterious colossal head that had been unearthed in 1862 by plantation workers, who had thought it was the base of a large kettle. Another of these strange colossal heads had already been found in the 1920s at a place called La Venta. Sterling was fascinated by the different art style of these heads, so he got funding from the National Geographic Society to excavate further at a nearby site named San Lorenzo. A suspiciously large rounded stone had been spotted protruding from the soil there. He and his crew dug it out. After that, they discovered and excavated a total of five colossal heads at San Lorenzo, Mexico. These heads were each carved with a distinctive human face. The style, which was also known from smaller stone sculptures and carved jades, was enigmatic and little understood at that time. Archaeologists were arguing over whether it was related to the better known Maya culture and whether it was from an earlier or a later date. They just didn't know. But the pieces of the puzzle began to come together. This sensational discovery, along with the unearthing of stone thrones and jadeites in a similar style, set in motion studies of this unusual culture. The culture was called by the name Olmec, or people of the rubber country, as they were named by the Aztecs. The low-lying Gulf Coast of Mexico, where the Olmec lived, was the place where rubber trees grew and rubber was used. Ultimately, 17 colossal Olmec heads were unearthed from the area now known as the Olmec heartland, Veracruz and Tabasco, Mexico. Ten heads alone came from this site of San Lorenzo. Not only were they artistically superb, they were unbelievably massive. These colossal heads weigh from 10 to 20 tons each. No one knew how to date them because they were so sophisticated and completely unique. And we have few means to date stone sculptures directly. The heads were all clearly of different individuals. These sculptures have great monumentality with unforgettable features. If we look at colossal head number one, this romantically named head unearthed first at San Lorenzo, we see a strong and powerful face. The features here are deeply carved and rounded and unusually expressive. The man who's portrayed appears to be in the prime of life, not young, and his look is somewhat forbidding. Look at his lips. They're quite thick, but sensitive, bordered with a double outline. The lips are strongly curved, fleshy, and slightly parted. The ends turn downward, which is a characteristic trait of Olmec-style faces. The lips are also asymmetrical, which is something that becomes more apparent with age. There is a deep central indentation under his chin. This also curves downward. His nose is short, broad, and flat, and the nostrils are well-defined. The cheeks are sensitively modeled, and they seem to sag a little over the cheekbones as they would in someone who's slightly older. There's a hint of jowls on either side of the chin. You get an impression of seriousness and age from these nasolabial folds, the soft indentation from the nostril to the lips, and from the slightly baggy indentations under the eyes. The eyes are deeply set 
and sharply cut in with lightly incised irises all under the shadow of a deep and low brow. They're almond shaped with an epicanthic fold, a skin fold that covers the inner corner of the eye. They're downwardly slanted as well. The face as a whole is broad and flat and almost squarish in shape. If you walk to the side, you can see that the back of the head is flattened. The ears are well carved and they have what we call an ear flare piercing through on both sides of the lobe. These ear, ear flares, we know, signify a person of high status. And if you compare head number one to head number eight, another stunningly alive monument, you can see the difference in features and expressions. For one thing, head number eight has slightly parted lips of a longer shape. You can see the suggestion of teeth within the mouth. Here you have a wider nose with differently shaped nostrils. The brow is markedly furrowed and lines are even incised in a triangle above the nose which gives him a look of worry or concentration. The shape of the lips is different too and the mouth is longer and wider than number ones. The grooves from the nose to the cheeks are linear and more sharply carved. The eyes are also set at a much steeper downward slope. You may also see that the eyes are slightly crossed, a trait which was valued by the Olmec and appears in other heads. Now the headgear is different as well. Number one has a tab-shaped element on the center of the band of his helmet, while number eight has two lappets that wrap almost to the front of the brim. These two heads are perhaps the most accomplished of the Olmec heads and deserve to be considered masterpieces. In fact, they're of such a huge size and bear such intense facial expressions that you can't help but be intimidated by them. They give off the impression of control, of leadership, and perhaps a hint of brutal power. There's no question that each of these heads is a portrait, and while we have no proof, they would almost assuredly have been rulers. We don't know whether they were carved in this colossal form as a memorial after death or during the lifetimes, but surely any San Lorenzo Olmec who saw these would be awed by the power conveyed. That effect is achieved by the immediacy of the individual and the sheer colossal size of the monument, not to mention the extreme labor and skill it would have taken to make these. Now, let's try something that's not often done. We'll compare this Olmec head from approximately 1400 to 1000 BC to a portrait of an important ruler from Middle Kingdom, Egypt, Senwazret III circa 1800 BC, also known as Sesostris. Look at them. They're both commanding men, unquestionably individuals. They are also men who show care and worry. How? Furrowed brows, heavy lidded eyes, hollows under the eyes, diagonal furrows on the cheeks. The mouths are sensitively rendered, although the lips could not be more different. Both are serious, careworn men in their prime. We know that Sinwazret, as pharaoh, chose this particular style, which was different from the youthful-looking sculptures of pharaohs before him. He seems to have wanted his populace to believe that he was a somber and imposing leader, someone who took his duties as ruler seriously. In fact, Sinwazret was a great military leader, Perhaps the impression he wanted to impart was similar to our Olmec ruler's presentation in these heads. We'll never know for sure, but we can guess. Let's look at a few more of the heads from San Lorenzo and La Venta so that you can get an idea of the wide range of features. This head, number five, was another found by Matthew Sterling at San Lorenzo. It is considered one of the finest along with the two we just looked at. You'll note that on top of the brimmed helmet, this person has a unique element, two three-clawed or taloned limp feet 
hanging down to his brow. They could be jaguar paws, but usually jaguars have more digits, so they could also be the talons of a raptorial bird. This element may have implied a name or a lineage symbol. This head is almost completely flat on the back, and the ear spools are round, rather different from the other heads. The flatness could be a clue that the head was carved out of another larger rectangular stone block. I'll talk about that later. Most of the colossal heads have ball game helmets, all different. On this one, a woven design on the top of the helmet gives some idea about the material of the helmet. Just a word about the ancient American ball game and its significance. The ball game was played all over pre-Columbian Mexico and Central America with a rubber ball. It was usually played in a ball court and involved teams who aimed the ball towards a ring or markers without using their hands. It was laden with cultural and mythic meanings, and it could be played on the level of religious ritual or simply sport. Sometimes players were sacrificed at the end of a ritual game, and I'll talk about that more later as well. Now this individual has the concerned look of the others, but his features are shallower, the mouth is more natural looking, and the nose is coarser. The head's finish also seems to be more pitted than the others, yet its fierce concentration and individuality are clear. It's believed that the Olmec may have practiced cranial deformation. They modified the heads of their babies when they were young. They seem to have preferred a flattened, lengthened skull shape, which could be likened to an ear of corn, the staple of their diet. The downward slant of eyes and lips may have been a result of this practice. What do we know about the culture which created such portraits? Let's go trekking in this place where the colossal heads were found. It's a hot and steamy land, a rainforest with lakes and rivers. Volcanoes tower in the distance. Jaguars prowled in the forest. All this beautiful wild territory borders on the ocean, the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. Today, the oil derricks extract the wealth of the province, and oil production is paramount. But from this same earth, four millennia ago, there arose the very first complex society in the Americas, the Olmec. They were a true civilization with monumental architecture and this amazing art in stone. You've just seen them, and they certainly make an enormous impression. They've been endlessly imitated in ways both serious and light. This example of a colossal head is a contemporary artist's take on it at the MFA Boston. There's more to the Olmec heads than meets the eye. There's a fascinating and intricate culture which lies at the root of the ancient civilizations of Mexico and beyond. The heartland of the Olmec culture is here, a part of Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is the name that archaeologists use to refer to this land and the culture that spread from southern Mexico down to northern Central America. The Olmec developed in an area which is now in the Mexican states of Tabasco and Veracruz. Rubber trees grow here. The properties of rubber were recognized by the mysterious people of Olman, which translates to the land of rubber. This area may very well have been the place where the sacred Mesoamerican ballgame cult started. Archaeologists even excavated rubber balls in a bog in this area, showing that they were known and used. The volcanic Tuxtla Mountains provided the hard basalt stone for the heads and for other sculpture. The stone was quarried and sent down the river as much as 35 miles on rafts in order to be carved. And all of this was done in the second millennium BC. Precious jadeite, a beautiful translucent green stone, was recognized as a kind of jade, was also obtained in trade from far away from what is today 
Guatemala. It was considered precious and used for many different purposes in small carvings in the art of the Olmec. Remarkably, the carving of these hard stones was done entirely with stone tools. Remember, they had no metal tools at all. They used abrasive sands for finishing surfaces, and they often polished them to a really fine sheen, and that took an enormous amount of time. The Olmec culture really arose in isolation. These people had no contact with the old world, which is why it's considered what anthropologists call a pristine civilization. Remember, humans only arrived in the Americas thousands of years after Europe and Asia had been settled out of Africa. There were only six or so pristine civilizations that developed in the history of the world, depending on how you count them, those that developed without prior models or contact. Now, we've looked at art from most of these. They include Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley in Pakistan and India, Shang Dynasty in China, and the Andean Chavin culture in Peru that we'll look at. The people who settled here in the Gulf of Mexico had a complex, stratified society by about 1500 BC. They produced the first monumental stone American artworks. They also moved massive amounts of earth and stone to build raised terraces and mounds for cities and temples. Now, there were three primary Olmec centers that I'll talk about, San Lorenzo, La Venta, and Tres Apotes. The first significant Olmec site and ceremonial center to flower was San Lorenzo, where these heads we looked at are from. Now this was a very early urban center in which the populace moved 2.2 million tons of earth in order to erect a capital, a city, on an island in a river. It was a raised platform of terraces with a system of stone aqueducts, aqueducts to manage water. It's thought that the colossal heads were set up in some sort of arrangement on a ridge there. The inhabitants of San Lorenzo created their city and their monuments sometime between 1800 and 1400 BC, it's thought. Now, that was around the same time as when the Babylonian Queen of the Night was made, and the time frame parallels the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. These striking developments we're looking at in the New World happened long before the Assyrian palaces or the Greek temples of the Parthenon had even been thought of. The Olmec people, and we don't actually know the name that they call themselves, had a sophisticated spiritual conception of the world. We now know, primarily from the artworks, but also thanks to archaeology, that they had a cult of the sacred mountain. That mountain had within it a cave of origin with a water source. The Olmec attempted to control the forces of nature by the ritual management of water. They also put the human ruler at the center of the cosmos. Olmecs expressed their beliefs in their artwork. Their style was very distinctive, and often it was startlingly naturalistic. Here you have an example of a thick, powerful bodied man, and the body is not static like an Egyptian noble. It moves in space, and the torsion or twisting of its torso is superbly expressed. The larger art of the Olmec was mostly focused on humans, their powerful bodies, and their faces. But much of their art depicted animal deities, primarily jaguars, and also snakes, caimans, harpy eagles, and monstrous supernaturals, animals conjoined with humans. Dolmec also had a rain baby, a supernatural baby with a fanged jaguar 
or animal mouth, sometimes shown in the arms of an elite person like this. Olmec artists were even able to show narrative in their sculpture, and sometimes they used multiple sculptures or stonework in tableau to represent their beliefs and their rituals. We believe that the Olmec developed many firsts in the Americas, although all of this is based on somewhat fragmentary evidence. They developed the first glyphic writing, the first calendar, it appears, and the first dated monuments. They also had the first pyramids or man-made mountains. The Olmec appear to have envisioned the world as a cosmos with four cardinal directions and an axis mundi, or world center. Remember Sanchi and Borobudur? We have a similar conception there. Now, this world center was associated with the ruler here. They had the first such hierarchical or stratified society in the Americas, as far as we now know. The cult of the ruler, which we see elsewhere in Mesoamerica, seems to have begun here. In monumental Olmec art, besides the colossal heads of rulers, we also see humans, possibly mythic jaguars, and mythic narratives with twins, like this. Here, a group of sculptures was found deliberately placed in some sort of arrangement. Two jaguars and two humans, twins. This is the first instance of twins appearing in sacred sculpture. Twins play an important part in Mesoamerican myth. Later on, the hero twins of the Quiche Maya appear in their sacred book, the Popol Vuh. Those twins were the magically begotten offspring of twin fathers who had disturbed the gods with their ball playing and were then tricked into going to the underworld where they were beheaded and sacrificed. The twin sons were cleverer. They became even better ball players than their fathers. The twins were summoned to the underworld by the gods to play ball, but this time the gods fell into the clever twins' traps. When one twin sacrificed the other and brought him back to life, the gods begged for the same treatment. Ah, but when the twins sacrificed the gods, they did not bother to revive them. <laughs> the gods of the underworld were vanquished. Now, corn, or maize, was the most important and sacred plant. This is an example. And we see that represented in their artworks. In fact, the basis of the Mesoamerican diet was maize. But it was here, too, that blood offerings to the gods became a central aspect of Mesoamerican society. We'll see in later cultures of Mesoamerica how all these aspects were melded together to form a pan-American philosophy and thought. There's a whole set of Mesoamerican beliefs that all may have started first right here in the land of the Olmec. That's why the Olmecs are often called the mother culture of Mesoamerica. Pioneering archaeologists found this Olmec sculpture in a rocky hollow near the peak of a volcano in the early 20th century. It was miles from San Lorenzo. Offerings were still being made to it by villagers. The work ties together many of the ideas presented in Olmec art and religion. We have an elite person wearing an elaborate headdress. The headdress bears a monstrous supernatural face, and its head has a cleft in it. From this cleft sprouts corn, the mainstay of life. The man has an unusual posture with one leg bent behind him, and he leans forward as if to lift the staff-like object he grasps. You can see that from the differing position of the hands, it will be raised to a vertical. We interpret this act as the ruler symbolically rendering the axis mundi. He's connecting the three parts of the cosmos, under, middle, and upper. His act puts him 
at the center. He was placed in the mountain, which, with its cave and sources of water flowing from its peaks, was a source of life. San Lorenzo has the most deeply carved and naturalistic colossal heads, but the heads continued to be made in La Venta as that center became powerful around 900 BC. La Venta heads are not as startlingly real, deeply carved, or as fine as those from San Lorenzo, but they include this one. The face is flatter, softer, and less definitively carved, yet it's unmistakably in the same vein as the earlier heads. The head was set up in a particular place in front of the pyramid at La Venta. There are two more interesting things at La Venta that I want to talk about, the pyramid and a throne. Monuments were positioned at the site in a carefully arranged series of plazas, mounds, and sculptures. Here, you can see the city's earthen pyramid, which dominated the center. It's 105 feet high and conical in shape. This was one of the earliest pyramids and one of the largest constructed in Mesoamerica. The pyramid, in its essence, represented the sacred mountain. The plazas formed gathering places with monumental sculptures impressively arranged around them. Processions came from the south, and they would reach this focal point. So the whole center was probably intended for ceremonies, which reenacted creation myths, and they also validated the ruler's power as the center of the cosmos. Many large stone monuments were found here on the plazas, but for us, the throne called Altar 4, mistakenly, is most interesting. Here is a very large rectangular block of stone. At the front and center, a sculpturally carved life-size figure, a man, emerges by leaning out of his cave-like niche. You can see that he wears a distinctive elaborate headdress and his posture resembles that figure found on the mountaintop at San Martin Pajapan. He is muscular and he holds a rope with both hands. The rope continues around the block of stone to the sides. Above him, the projecting stone ledge turns into the gaping maw of a monster, a jaguar-like animal. It might remind you of a Shang bronze from China with a tiger's jaws over a human head. We see its fangs and nostrils. This is a conception of the monster maw as place of origin and emergence. It's an image of a cave within a sacred, supernatural mountain. You can even see that plants sprout from the corners, another sign of the mainstay of life. The ruler figure, for that's what he would seem to be, holds the rope, which seems to bind captives depicted on the side in relief. We know this was used as a throne from a picture in a stone found far away in an Olmec-influenced area called Chalcatzingo. So imagine the ruler, elaborately and impressively dressed, most likely in an animal costume, seated upon this high stone block above his people. It would be impressive, and the ruler would be associated with the myth of creation and the origin of humanity and supernatural powers. Now, here's the really curious part. We know that such thrones, and there are others, were recarved. Some were recarved into colossal heads. That is why a number of the colossal heads have very flat backs. They were probably just the rear sides of the throne. Why did they do this? It's possible, although we'll probably never know for sure, that they were memorializing a dead ruler by carving his throne into his image. The memorial image of the ruler was then set up in the plaza near the pyramid and his fearsome face looked upon the subjects and the participants in the Olmec ceremonies. The rulers were thus never forgotten, 
and they were forever linked with the rites relating to creation and sustenance of the cosmos. We now know that the Olmec liked to recreate their myths of creation. They often did this by arranging groups of sculptures in a configuration that mirrored those myths. By the way, that was something we saw in Greece as well. The Olmec and later Mesoamerican myths were intricately connected with the power of the ruler. This is not so different from what we've seen elsewhere, particularly in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. The sustenance and fertility of life were gifts from the gods, and the ruler manipulated imagery to make himself seem central to that power. Rulers created the myth of their own centrality and became supernaturals themselves. This linking of the ruler with the central powers of the cosmos is important. We'll see it also in our next lecture. The Maya civilization reached its full flowering more than 2,000 years after the Olmec. It appears to have many of the same myths and conceptions that powered the Olmec. This idea that the ruler is at the center of the cosmos is one of the most important ones. That concept is perhaps most beautifully expressed in the sarcophagus of the best-known ruler of the Maya world, Pakal the Great of Palenque. We'll see next how Pakal manipulated the symbols and myths of Palenque and the Maya people in order to maintain the power of the ruling elite. He put himself at the center of the cosmos. The art itself actually served to maintain the social and religious order. That order had been created by millennia of myth-making and culture. Pakal's death was the inspiration for the greatest example of artwork which serves these purposes. <laughs>